Yeah. I don't think they're ready for this. Gotta give it Forget about it. Hey, yo, at the speed of sound. It's the world now, wax works compound. So gather round and witness something that is rarely found. The Database Building Block seminar series is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This program is made possible by Google. All right, guys, let's get started. It's another day. It's another time to talk about databases. Uh, so we're excited today to have Philippe. Uh, he is the co-founder of ParadeDB. He's going to talk about how he's using Postgres, but he's putting a bunch of crap inside of it, building blocks inside of it to make it better. So um, as always, if you have any questions for Philippe as he's giving the talk, please unmute yourself and ask your question anytime. Say who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, it's always good to know where everyone is. Uh, and then feel free to do this anytime because we want you know Philippe to feel like he's talking to a bunch of people and not just uh, talking to a blank screen on Zoom. Okay, Philippe, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Go for it. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me. And it's nice to to have everyone listening. So um, yeah, as Andy said, I'm one of the founders of ParadeDB. I'm honored to be here today. We're speaking about full text search and analytics in Postgres. ParadeDB is a um, Postgres database built as by a Postgres extension that we're modifying with database building blocks to, to make better for specifically full text search and analytics. We're trying to compete with workloads that are traditionally served by Elasticsearch. Um, so we're trying to bring the good that people love with Postgres, MVCC, asset compliance, high performance joins, world class reliability, um, but solve the limitations around search and analytics that um, you know that Postgres is not you know, not excelling at. Uh, let's see. Okay, perfect. So um, the talk is going to be split into four sections. Feel free to stop me at any time. First, we'll cover ex existing full text search functionalities in Postgres. Um, I understand a lot of folks in the CMU audience might be very familiar with this, but if you're not, um, it'll be a good refresher and it's going to contextualize what we'll be speaking about after. We'll talk about what's missing and, and why we can make it better, uh, specifically around two areas that we work with. So PG Search is the name of our Postgres extension that ParadeDB builds. We use it to innovate around full text search and we use it to innovate around aggregates or facets. So before we get into it, a couple of jargon to make sure everyone's on the same page. I'm sure folks here are very familiar with databases. You may even be familiar with data fusion concepts as well um, after listening to Andrew and Andy's talks that I believe were the last two ones, but um, perhaps not too much about full text search. So first, tokenization. It's the process of splitting words into searchable chunks. You can tokenize by languages, for example, and words as defined in French, words as defined in Chinese. Uh, stemming is the concept of reducing words to their root form. So if you have the word running, the stem would be the word run. Inverted index is what we use to accelerate full text search. For ADB, adds a new inverted index in Postgres that we'll talk about in a second, but there's many that are already supported. Aggregation, I guess, you know, I'll skip over that for this audience, but uh, you know what it is. Crunching some numbers to get counts, sums, averages. Facets is specifically aggregation over full text search. So you know, how many search results return the word foo, for example. And then the Elastic DSL, uh, you'll hear a little bit about Elasticsearch. For those of you that are not familiar, Elasticsearch is the state-of-the-art search engine that, that companies build on today. And um, it has a powerful language that is used to do complex search uh, logic. And ParadeDB offers similar capabilities, and we kind of refer them um, by our own version of the Elastic DSL. So. Before we get into this, who am I and who are the people behind ParadeDB? So as Andy said, my name is Philippe. I'm one of the founders of ParadeDB. I'm originally from Riviera de Lille, Quebec, uh, which is a small French speaking town in Canada. I studied CS at Harvard, but I never took a database class. I know it's a big mistake. You know, I'm not proud of it, but uh, you know, we'll brush from it up today. And then, um, yeah, if you're curious to learn more about me, Postgres is this cool community where they do little interviews about the people behind Postgres. I highly encourage all of you to join the Postgres community if you're not a part of, but you can read more about, about uh, myself on that interview there. So what is ParadeDB and how do we make Postgres better? It's an Elasticsearch alternative on Postgres. PG Search, which is what we'll talk about today, is our core work. It's full text search in Postgres with BM25. We'll cover what BM25 is in, um, a, a, you know, shortly. And then it's built in Rust because you know who doesn't nowadays. You have to be part of the cool the cool kids crowd. And we have some other work that we've done around an extension called PG Analytics that is going to be set aside from today. But I'm happy to talk about it another time. Why is this even worth doing? I think that's something that's worth talking about as well. When we tell people that we improve search and analytics in Postgres, a lot of them are wondering why. So. One thing that brings people from Elastic to something like Parade is data reliability. Transaction safety on your search engine is, is very important. We have a lot of 
uh, users that complain that Elasticsearch is not reliable. You also get to remove any ETL pipeline and delays that might be, you know, reasoning uh, coming from that, excuse me. You don't have to denormalize your data. That's a huge, huge, huge thing. Anyone here that loves databases uh, knows that, they, you know, the SQL and structured data format is a big deal. And in the search engine world, it's not a part of it at all. So we're trying to bring that back. And then that also helps us do better on this kind of the update heavy um, scenarios. We started this about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And before we really dive into it, I do want to talk about the people that are building this because I'm not the only one. I only happen to be the one that gets the privilege to talk about it. So Ming on the on the bottom left is our CTO, my co-founder. He's also the author of most uh, of a good chunk of the slides on this presentation. So he gets a lot of credit for it. Neil in the middle is um, one of our lead search engineers. And then Eric in um, in third in third uh, the third photo is the author of ZomboDB and PGRX, which is the framework we use to build our product. He's quite a famous person in the Postgres world, and we're very fortunate to have all these folks. Okay, enough, uh, you know, enough household housekeeping. Excuse me. Um, let's get started. So, what is full text search? For those of you that are not familiar, full text search is essentially simply the process of doing keyword-based retrieval for documents within your database. It can be very simple, it can be very complex. Pretty much every database nowadays supports some version of full text search in some shape or form. Um, on the very simple layer, you can say, hey, retrieve me all the documents that match a specific keyword like cheese, but you can also have some very complex full text search. You might want to rank your search results in various ways. You might want to search for a corpus of text in multiple languages. You might want to do analytics or aggregates on those search results, say, you know, retrieve me the top 10, but tell me how many results there would have been, so on and so forth. And it's broken down in two steps. The indexing step, which we'll talk a lot about today, one of the big database building blocks that we use at ParadeDB um, is around the indexing layer, which is a library called Tentivy. That allows us to pre-process the text to make it searchable efficiently. And then the querying layer is simply running and writing those queries to retrieve the data. We, you know, in the age of AI, we need to do a, a point on, on vector search and what it is and isn't. So vector search is similarity search. And we have a, a, you know, a seminar section on all the vector databases that exist today, ParadeDB. We don't think of ourselves as a vector database, although we do support vectors. Um, the key difference is vectors match um, words based on their semantic meaning. So, you know, similar synonyms and so on go very well together um, and can be retrieved via vector search. In Postgres, is a very famous extension called PG Vector that offers this. What ParadeDB does is we focus on full text search, so the keyword side of it, and it's very, very powerful and not at all you know, obsolete from vector search. It's very powerful, especially for words that don't have semantic meanings. So if I'm searching for the name Andy Pablo in a database, keyword search is gonna do a lot better. If you're searching for medical codes, stock tickers, you know, product brand names, things like that. Um, and that's what we cover, we cover today. But most of the people that use ParadeDB actually use both together using, you know, in a type of search called hybrid search. But that's beyond the scope of today's work. Okay, so full text search in Postgres. There's three ways in which we do full text search in Postgres before ParadeDB came around. And then we'll cover what we do that's different. So one is the like operator. That's a very basic way to do search. It's essentially just string comparison. The core full text search is Postgres uses something called TS vector. This vector is a standard way to do it. It has real expressivity. You can do re-ranking, you can deal with misspelling. It has pretty good performance as well. And then lastly, there's another extension that's part of core Postgres called PG Trigram, which allows putting words in trigrams. We'll cover what that is. And um, it allows you to do some sort of misspelling or basic auto-completion on top of TS vector. If you use a hosted Postgres anywhere in the world, these are what you have access to today. The like operator syntax looks something like you can see here. So column name, like pattern. So if you take the example query, select star from users where name like John, this would match names like Johnny, Johnson, Jonathan, um, things like that. The limitation that it has is it's quite slow and it's also very limited. One of the key concepts in full text search is the ability to rank results based on which ones you think are going to be most relevant. And the like operator has no concept of, of ranking. So it will return every result with the same the same way. But that's you know nonetheless a way you can get started, and many people use it in Postgres today. 
when you want to go into a proper way to do full text search in Postgres, people will use TS vector. So it stores the tokenized stem representation of text, so breaking down into the sub the roots of the words, and then you can rank the results that you retru- that you return using something called uh, TS rank, which under the hood implements an algorithm called TFIDF. Perhaps some of you are familiar with TFIDF. It stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. In short, what this means is documents or, or rows in the case of Postgres, where the keyword you're searching for, let's say cheese, occurs more, more frequently, should be ranked higher. Makes sense. And if that document is less frequently found in the corpus, then it should rank higher as well. So if you're searching for cheese and you have one document with a lot of occurrences of cheese, but none in the other documents, it should probably rank higher versus let's say a word like the, which is going to be very, very frequently present across the entire corpus. So it doesn't have a lot of information it conveys as to whether this is a word that, um, this is a document that should be ranked higher. Moving on, um, the search result that you can do with TS vector doesn't have to use any index. So we talked about an inverted index briefly. You can do everything, which is the TS vector data type. If you do that, though, whenever you do a search, Postgres, in our case, is going to need to scan the entire table row by row to find everything. That's known as a sequential scan, and that's very slow. Postgres has concepts of inverted indices, which are our data structure that store representation between the word and where they can be found in the corpus. And instead, you can make it use that index to do much faster searching. In practice, pretty much every single full text search implementation uses an inverted index in some form, otherwise the performance is, is very, very slow. Lastly, you can use something called PG Trigram. So as I was mentioning, PG Trigram is an extension that was built into the core Postgres code base. It splits words into groups of three characters. So if I keep the example of the word cheese, you can see the trigram would be C-H-E, H-E-E, E-E-S, and E-S-E, and it can be used to do basic auto-completion. So if I'm missing certain, certain letters, let's say in the word I'm searching for, I can use PG Trigram to make sure that my users are still going to retrieve the information that they're looking for. It's pretty limited in what it can do, but it can get you part of the way. So what is Postgres full text search missing? I think this is where things start to get very interesting. One thing that it's missing is something called BM25 scoring or BM25 relevance. BM25 is an algorithm that is a um, an improvement upon the TF-IDF algorithm. If any of you in the audience wanted to do a thought experiment right now, you can think based on how we defined the TF-IDF algorithm just one or two slides before, how can you think of gamifying that algorithm to make sure your results rank higher? What could be things that skew it in a certain way? And how can we fix those in a better algorithm? The second thing Postgres full text search is missing is powerful tokenizers and token filters. So if you're searching in a specific language, for example, or especially in English, it works pretty well, but you might want to search in multiple languages in the same query, for example. Or Postgres also doesn't have a good understanding of non-Latin languages like Chinese, for example. It would tokenize each character in its own word, but in reality, in Chinese, multiple characters can form a word, and it would be better if they were tokenized together. This is something that's not super well supported in TS Vector. It also doesn't have an elastic DSL complex um, search API. So giving you the ability to say, okay, I want different words to be ranked differently, doing disjunction max or weighing the scores in a specific way. Those are quite difficult to do with Postgres today. And lastly, it doesn't have very strong facets or aggregation. So if any of you have used Postgres before and you've tried to do a, a count star over a hundred million rows or hundreds of millions of rows, you know that it can be very, very slow. And that's a very common thing to do in full text search. It's very common if you use an e-commerce ca- catalog, for example, to say, hey, here's 10 results, but there's a hundred million results, right? Um, to give uh, users a, an order of, of magnitude. This is the core of what we do is fix these limitations. So let's cover that. First of all, what is BM25? So this is the formula for BM25. You can you can take a look, but we'll go over it in a sec. There's two main things that it improves upon the TF-IDF algorithm. The first thing that it improves on is um, it factors in the document length. So if you remember, TF-IDF says the more often a keyword is present, the higher the document should be ranked. Well. 
naturally documents that are longer are going to have higher occurrences in a specific keyword. And so obviously it would skew towards longer documents, which may not necessarily be the most relevant from the user's perspective. So what BM25 does is it factors in the document lag, as you can see on, on the formula in the, in the lower right. In that case, it says, okay, we'll keep into account the document length in order to calculate the score. The second thing that it improves over is a concept called term saturation. So let's say I'm searching for cheese and I have a document with a thousand occurrences of the word cheese and another one with 950. Well, they're probably both pretty relevant to the user and the extra 50 might not make a very big difference. So what BM25 does is it keeps in mind, you know, the number of occurrences of, of a specific keyword and as they get more and more present, their weighing is less and less impactful onto the score so that you don't have just extreme amounts of repetitions influencing the score linearly, as you can see on the tapering off in the curve at the bottom. This is a pretty simple algorithm actually, but it is nonetheless the state of the art used today by all the standard search engine like Elasticsearch, like ParadeDB and, and many others. And unfortunately, Postgres doesn't support it. Postgres doesn't keep the full corpus, it doesn't keep the statistics, excuse me, over the full corpus of information that it stores. And so it doesn't have the ability to calculate all of that um, that it would require to do the M25 search. So instead they implement TFIDF and they have some small modifications to it, um, like something called cover density, which allows you to keep in mind like whether words are close to each other and so on. And you can get some slight improvements upon TFIDF, but it's not quite comparable. Okay, enough. Um, you know, enough, enough math and enough, enough preamble for now. So what is P, what is ParadeDB, what is PZ Research, and how do we solve these, um, these four limitations that I mentioned here? So we're a Rust extension in Postgres. Many of the companies innovating in Postgres doing like a Postgres extension. Postgres is very, very modular, and the Postgres extension API allows you to do some serious work with it. You can... Um, Looking at the query layer, at the query planner layer, excuse me, at the executor, at the storage layer, you can do a lot. And that's how we build. We build with a framework called PGRX, which conveniently was written by Eric, who's one of the members of our team. It allows you to write Postgres extensions in Rust. And the database building block that we integrate with the most is a search library called Tentuvi. So Tentuvi is essentially a Rust-based search library. It's inspired by a library called Lucene which is a Java-based search library that is used by Elasticsearch and many others. It's a very battle-tested uh, search engine and it supports full-text search, it supports fast faceting, it supports BM25 scoring, it supports inver inverted indices, it also supports columnar storage, which we'll cover again in the later part of the talk for how you can improve on, on analytics and facets. And it's essentially the core solution to many of the issues that Postgres faces. Thanks to our PGRX Rust extension framework, we can work with Tentv in a very, in a very clean way and start to bring in some of the good that it offers directly inside Postgres. Maybe you're going to, you'll get to this, but this Tentv is it running in the same address space as Postgres? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can Any other talk, questions? Can you talk about what, like, I mean, did you at least consider Lucene, or just Java as a non-starter for what you guys wanted to do? Yeah, great question. So Tentv is a pretty mature project. It's maybe eight or nine years old by now, um, something along those lines. It's used by a lot of companies, but it's obviously not as mature and as tried and tested as Lucene. Lucene might be 15 or 20 years old by now. Um, we did not consider Lucene for two reasons. Uh, one, and you'll see in the next slide, the speed of Tentv is significantly faster thanks to removing the overhead from the Java virtual machine. Um, and it also makes some slightly different design decisions, which I think are actually more applicable to us. But um, it's essentially not possible, at least as far as I know, to work with Java inside of a Postgres extension. So for up to us, it was C or Rust. Obviously, Rust was ideal, and TentV was the best search library in Rust, and so that's kind of how we came to it. And, and if, if you're going to talk about this, cut me off. But like, there's also like Zapien, right? The other one that, that's that's in C plus plus. Did you guys consider that as well? Yeah, I'm familiar with Zapien. Uh, we did not consider Zapien at the time. We wanted to work in Rust specifically, and Zapien is also quite old, but I don't know if yeah. it's as active of a project as, um, you know, as Tentv is nowadays. So we decided to go for kind of the true interested. We actually never benchmarked them, but um, 
yeah, that would have been another viable option. There's another one called Brunga in C, in Pure C, that also would have been an option. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So speaking of speed, um, Zapian is not benchmark here, but that's another one that exists. But anyway, so Tentivy is super fast. It is super, super fast. You can see here the average query latency compared to, um, to Lucene, which is sort of the state of the art one. Believe is another one um, that I believe is written in Go. If I remember correctly, that's another popular one. And then a PISA I'm not familiar with, but that gives you a rough idea. In our own benchmarking, we've observed query performance compared to Lucene to be 5x on, on our own implementation of Tentivy. So that's a quite a big deal. The way Tentivy manages to be so fast is it uses an immutable segment-based design. This is similar to what Lucene does, but basically instead of mutating the the index segments that store the tokenized data, it simply creates new ones and merge them, compacts them behind the scene um, to have faster writes, faster reads. It also uses memory map files so that disk IOs are very, very quickly, a uh, very quick, excuse me. It builds in Rust, so you can to remove the whole overhead of the Java virtual machines. And then it uses SIMD, which is vectorized processing on the CPU to, um, to, to do parallel execution very quickly. All of these are the very, very high level ways for why Tentivy is fast. I'm not one of the authors of Tentivy. Paul and a lot of folks behind a company called QuickWit are the authors of Tentivy. That would make for a wonderful talk, um, but that's beyond the scope of, of today. We're gonna talk mostly about Postgres and what we, you, we, we do with this rather than how it's built. So getting to the meat of the presentation and where ParadeDB really innovates. So we have four things that we do in Postgres in order to build ParadeDB PG search. The first is we introduce our own full text search operator. This is the part that allows us to define in SQL full text search queries with more syntax expressivity that can be passed down to Tentivy or fast search engine. On top of this, we put our own Postgres inverted index as we discussed before, inverted indices are very important to accelerate the speed at which you can process queries, full text search queries. We introduce an index that we call the DM25 index. It's a standard Postgres index that you can use in, in all the same ways. We then have a query builder API that allows us to replicate some of the really complex functionalities and really complex logic that you might want out of a proper search engine into Postgres. And lastly, and perhaps the most exciting part of all that we do is we create our custom scan that defines how we, we scan data in Postgres and feeds it into, into Tentivy. And we'll cover that in, in the later half of the talk. So our custom full text search operator, this is how we define the search queries. It can be dropped in any Postgres query. That's one of the most powerful or the most liked features of, of ParadeDB from, from users. If you have joins, you have order buys, group buys, anything that you like to do with Postgres today, you can just drop in or at, at, at full text search operator, and it's going to give you the ability to reference um, full text search queries in that, in that standard SQL query. So you can take the example here, select star from mock items where ID is less than 10 and description is keyboard. What this does behind the scenes with the at, at, at operator is it's gonna pass the, the value keyboard to the description field intensity and then execute a full text search query on it, even though you might have other predicates as you have in the, in the example here. This is built using the Postgres create operator API. That's a pretty well-documented API you can take a look at. Um, and that's sort of the bare minimum that you need in order to start bringing the full text search syntax of Tentivy in, in Postgres. So St Steve Moy asked, uh, hey Steve, how's it going? I was asking, is the at, 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 is that a SQLism or a Postgresism or a Parade DBism, maybe? It's a, it's a Parade DBism, but it's inspired by a Postgresism. It's inspired by the TS vector at, at operator. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Once we have this at, at, at operator that allows us to feed our queries attentively, now we need a custom index to make them faster. We don't want to be doing sequential scans over our entire tables. So instead, we want to index into what we call the BM25 index, um, the value of the content of a table. So it works the exact same way that any standard Postgres index work, whether you have a B tree or a gin index or whatever you might be used to using in Postgres for index constructions, updates, vacuum scans, everything works in the same way. The key difference with our index is that it's a BM, the BM25 index is a covering index. So 
what this means is the parade DB index is designed to be created over multiple columns, all the ones that are relevant to the full text search queries that you might want to run. This actually allows us to push down all sorts of predicates and sort into the search index directly and drastically speed up the way we do retrieval. And we'll cover that more in the custom scan part. I mean, hold on. To so do the, it's, it's not a true, I mean, covering index is something that dynamically is, you know, depends on the query, depends on the index, right? So you're just saying that if someone wanted to, they could put all the columns in your BM25 index and then correct. that you, you could then use it as a covering index. Correct, correct, correct. Okay. Right. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, Great question. And maybe maybe get this in a second. Like, does does Tan TV does it provide its own BM twenty five index, or you have to roll your own? Are you are you no. just interfacing into it? So so we are interfacing into it. The uh, Tan TV has the ability to do inverted and in, it supports inverted index. But what where we interface is we use the index access method API or yep. Postgres to make it a proper Postgres index. And um, that's actually a, a quite a serious amount of work. I would say gluing the pieces between Postgres and, and TenTV is a big deal. I'll touch upon this a little bit more later, but when you work with Postgres, you can't regress on any of the Postgres feature, right? And Postgres is a very opinionated database. That's one of the reasons it's so good. So we have to work in a Postgres way in order to sort of connect all of the layers together. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, anyways, so we use the index access method API for this. Third, so now we have the ability to define search queries and we have the ability to execute them against our BM25 index so they can be very quick. However, now we want them to be very expressive. If you've used the Elasticsearch API before, you know that the DSL can take the form of very complex subnested JSON that might apply logic at different parts of the query. The TentoV is built in a similar way and Parade DB offers uh, also the ability to accept JSONs on the right-hand side of the syntax. We give you the ability to construct those, those functions in more of a Postgres-y, sql -y way by our Query Builder API. It looks something like this, um, and gives you the ability to do boosting, fuzzy search, fuzzy phrasing, Booleans, anything that you might want to do with a complex full-text search. So if you look at the example query here, you say, OK, in this full-text search query, we're saying, we're going to search essentially for the keywords description shoes or description running. So we're searching for running shoes, but we're going to boost the value of the shoes by 2x what the value is going to be for standard word running. So let's say you're building a search engine. You want people to search for an e-commerce catalog and be able to retrieve running shoes. Well, if there's shoes in the name, it's probably a more indicative search than if it has running. So let's ask for, for running shoes. Maybe after seeing running shoes, I might want to see just shoes in general rather than running shorts. This gives you the ability to bake this logic into the search query. In order to do this, we use our Query Builder API. Behind the scenes, the way this is built is by a Postgres user-defined functions. So we abstract away the JSON syntax to make it easier for, for users to write standard uh, SQL queries as they might expect it. I see, I, I see some uh, bubbles popping. Question. In. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify that when you talk about Query Builder API and like the query itself, uh, what you're referring to here is like the text search engine portion of it, not the like Postgres Postgres query engine portion of it, right? Like there's there's basically like two layers of query right. engines here that you're talking about, right? Okay. Thanks. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Does any does yes. any does any of the Parade DB part that goes to the, the, the full text search, does that get, get exposed to the Postgres query optimizer to do anything special with it or anything with it? Or no, it just sees it as a UDF. Um, so these are just UDFs, but you will see very soon once we talk to the next part of the custom scan, we integrate quite deeply with the planner to, to, um, to optimize some of that stuff. So we'll touch yeah. on that in a minute. Hi, right, thanks. Yeah, any other questions? OK, carrying on. So now we have the ability to define full text search queries. We can execute them quickly over inverted indices called BM25 index and Postgres. All of these use BM25 scoring and everything that TenTV brings. And we have the ability to define some complex syntax and ranking logic around it with a query builder. Comes the sort of combination of all of this via what we call the custom scan. So the Postgres custom scan API is one of the less known and harder to work with, I would say, APIs. 
um, and it allows us to take control of other parts of the query beyond the where at 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 clause. In our case, it enables three interesting use cases that are very important for bridging the gap of full text search in Postgres. One is predicate pushdown. Second is doing the DM25 scoring. And then lastly, the fast facets and aggregation. And that's where we'll touch upon some of the work we're doing as, as well with data fusion, um, which I know you were, uh, were the topic of the first two talks in this seminar. So in the case of predicate pushdown, consider the query here. Select star from mod item where the description is keyword and rating is less than five. If we didn't have a custom scan, Postgres with the index access method that we describe on our PM25 index is going to do separate scans over the description rating, uh, the description and the rating, excuse me. Even though, because as we mentioned before, both are in the BM25 index, we should be able to do it in a single scan. This is you know, very bad for performance, obviously, and we want to combine them together. The custom scan allows us to do this. It also allows us to push things like limits and offsets all the way down into 10 to V so that we can drastically improve performance in that way. Let's take an example of what it looks like here. So as you can see here, we have an example query that we're running, select description rating and category from mock items where the description is shoes or the rating is more than two. Here's an example of what the query plan actually looks like on ParadeDB so you can see it in action. So in this case, the ParadeDB scan is done over that, that table, mock item, it's done over the index we've created. We're not doing BM25 scoring yet, we'll do that in a second, but you can see in the 10 to be query that we're passing down, we're actually combining it all into a single query for both the rating being greater than two and the description matching shoes. That allows us to do a single index, uh, index scan, excuse me, and drastically speed up performance. This is all thanks to the custom scan API. Another example of what this enables us to do is scoring projection. So, as we mentioned, BM25 scoring is very important when you're building a proper state-of-the-art search engine. And we need to be able to return that information to the user so they can build logic on top of it, on top of ParadeDB. Let's say we have the query here. Consider select from mock items with the description and keyword. How can we return the score? Well, the custom scan API allows us to do this, the scoring in 10 to V and project it to the user into a new column. This is an example of what the query plan would look like here. So it's very similar as the previous one, but you can see we have scores enabled as true. And we now have the ability to say, when we're going to execute that query against Postgres and fundamentally against ParadeDB, we're going to be returning ParadeDB.score as a new column in addition to the core columns that are in, in our mock items table. What this looks like is very standard Postgres SQL uh, result set syntax. You can see here we're returning descriptions, everything that matches shoes, for example, the rating, the category that it fits in in our mock data set, and the BM25 score as available here. So you can see, okay, these shoes are ranking higher than plastic keyboard, which obviously is not relevant to description shoe. So is your implementation smart enough to recognize that you're calling on the score? It's in, it's in, the, it's in the select output. So instead of calling for every single item as you scan the UDF, that you can push down the UDF so that like so that like it's generated as part of the, the the scan operator and not like and not fired off as a part of the projection. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Cool. And that has so that has a big impact on performance, of course. Yeah. Um, before before custom scan, the if you were to do BM25 scoring on Parade DB, it would have a very serious impact on um, the speed at which we could return queries. But now we can actually uh, imp uh, optimize this significantly. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Um, okay, any questions before we start talking about the analytics and facets? So I, I had a question. So yes. the rating, that's a numerical column. So how is that stored in 10 TV? Is that, that's not a text or a display column like description? Uh, yes, good question. Yeah, so I brushed over this a little bit quickly, but 10 TV has support for a wide range of types. You can store tags, you can st uh, store numeric, you can store date times, you can store range types as well. So all of this gets stored in 10 to be um, in the inverted index and get to be searchable in, in a standard ways. You can all, I mean, you wouldn't tokenize it, you know, the way you tokenize text, but um, you can store it as well directly as the type that it represents. And we do some mapping between the Postgres types and the 10 to be types. How, how challenging is that mapping? So like the, the data fusion guy talked last week, like comment mapping, 
spark yep. comment map spark into the data fusion how bad is it or how difficult yeah. is it yeah that's a great question we'll talk more about that as well once we talk about the analytics for the the standard mapping i would say tentivy has quite a wide range of types that it supports so it's not been too too difficult um, when we start talking about the way we do columnar storage in tentivy and the mapping there uh, it's been a lot more challenging and I'll, I'll cover this in a minute and then if someone shows up with uh, UDT, do you just give up and can't support it? Or do you actually support that as well? That is a great question. So far, I don't think we've faced this use case. So okay. I wouldn't know exactly which answer to tell you. But we can look into it and get back to you. I mean, if, it, if it's like an alias, like it's, it's just like you, two ints become, the two of two ints become an own type, that should be able to support it. But someone, if they, most people don't implement like their own C level UDT. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll right, keep yeah. going. This is great. Any other questions before we talk into ongoing work, columnar aggregations, and things like that? One more question. So say the rating column, it was better indexed by one of the other Postgres indexes and not an inverted index. So yes. would you support that? Great question as well. Uh, yes, you can still do everything that you do in Postgres, whether you're using ParadeDB or not. So it's also compatible with B-tree indexes and GIN indexes and so on. Um, it, and we actually recommend that um, users, you also use B-tree indexes, especially when they have update heavy scenarios, for instance. But um, usually people don't also use a GIN index because the BM25 index is sort of a superset of that. But any other index is, is supported and common to operate alongside the BM25 index. So how do you deal with that in the planner? How deeply do you go into the cost model for the planner to have it decide which index to use first, for example, if it has multiple choices, including using this inverted index and a B3 index? Yeah, good question. So the um, for the BM25 index, we only allow you to use a single index per table right now so that we don't have any confusing logic around whether, you know, which index to select from. And then we do have some cost optimization that we do to, uh, to prefer like index only scans and things like that over other types of scans. But um, that would say that's the main way that we optimize it today. We have some further, some further work integrating with the planner that's coming. And I'll talk about that in a second as well. I have a question about the binding portion uh, in terms of like, so I think in order to do the predicate pushdown with rating, you basically have to be able to know that rating and description are both in the index. So is, is it really just like when you have that index, like that information is available, like if there's a predicate expression with these things, like just match it, or is it actually like, you know, however you're interfacing with TV, like, is there like a kind of more dynamic step there? I'm, I'm just kind of curious about that. Yeah, good question. Uh, it is mostly static today. So if when you define your index, you need to put every column that you want to us to be able to match with uh, in the index as part of the index creation. And if you have any other columns that you want to index over, you will need to re-index as a result if you modify the, the schema that gets indexed. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Okay, moving on, and then we, we can come back to some more questions. So if you remember, there were three use cases that we talked about for, for a custom scan. One was BM25 scoring. This is what we just covered. The other one was predicate pushdown to optimize performance. But the third one is fast facets and aggregations, which we haven't talked about yet. This is part of our ongoing work right now, so we'll get a sneak peek at the inside of the factory of how things are being made and some decisions that we're currently wrestling with and deciding what to go what to go for. So the problem we have is facets are slow, right? So as we talked about before, this query you can see here is a pretty good example of a, of a faceted search query. So we're searching on our table mock items where the description is true, rating is more than two, and we also want to do a count ID. We want to return the list of all the results that would actually have been returned were it not for the limit 10. Give me the top 10 results and the total of number of results found. That's a very canonical use case for full text search. If we're doing this with Postgres, as you know, the count ID is going to be very slow, especially if we have millions of results. Tentivy has the concept of fast fields. 
what tend to be defined as a fast field is a columnar type storage. So let's say we index IDS fast field when we create our index, it's going to tell um, Postgres that this is stored in a columnar format within the index and ID could be returned to Postgres in columnar batches. So the way Postgres is built, it uses something called pages. A page is eight kilobyte and the Postgres visibility checker as part of the MVCC implementation can um, can work on a per page basis for defining visibility or not visibility on specific rows. As a result, if you, you know, if you infer this a bit further, you can think, okay, we could use something like this to essentially build our own vectorized faceting engine. We use Tentivy to store fields, let's say the ID field as fast in a columnar format, and we have Postgres process it in batches, determine visibility, and then return the results to, to the users. Moreover, the custom scan API in Postgres enables parallelization. This is quite rare. Postgres is single threaded, but in the custom scan, the developer has the opportunity and the responsibility to, to implement parallelized execution on them, uh, themselves. So we could build some sort of faceting engine. If you've attended the previous talks from Andy Grove and Andrew Lamb about data fusion, you know this is essentially at a very, very high level the way you know, analytical query engines are built. That's quite exciting. This gives us the ability to start thinking, okay, we could perhaps improve upon the, the faceting performance. Here enters something like data fusion, right? So as I'm sure you know, if you've attended the previous talk, data fusion is an embeddable query engine. It's built in Rust, it processes arrow batches, and tend to be is currently exploring whether to modify its own columnar implementation with data fusion. Right now it's kind of a custom implementation, so there's some wiring that needs to be done behind the scenes. But if we start to do this, we could say, hey, we could actually use tend to be to accelerate to store data in columnar format process it in a vectorized way and use data fusion to do very fast um, parallel vectorized execution on top of it via the Postgres custom scan API. This would allow us to start to have a really fast high performance query engine to do faceting in Postgres specifically over search results. So we could let data fusion do the count, for example. This would be a really big deal, but this is something that we're currently looking at and there's a lot of considerations to keep in mind. First, we're working with Postgres. Wait, sorry, sorry. Yes. The, the last slide you said ten to be on its own is 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 going to replace its internal column stuff with data fusion. It's, correct. They're currently so they're currently exploring whether to do it. Ten to be doesn't use Arrow. They have their own columnar format, and so in order to swap in something like data fusion as their processing engine, there's some wiring that needs to be done. But yes, this is something that we're discussing as so, part so of the project. So, so the choice is either so independent of whether ten to be switches to data fusion. Like you, you're talking about like can can ParadeDB use data fusion as well? Yes, that's right. Kind of, that's okay. right. That's right. Thanks. We've actually we've actually done some work with data fusion before in a different part of Postgres at the storage layer for like columnar tables. That's a bit beyond the scope of the talk, and it's less related to our full text search. But where we would bring data fusion in here would be to accelerate our faceted search. But in order for us to consider doing this in the first place, we need to remember that we're working within the confines of Postgres. Is it possible for us to make data fusion Postgres MVCC compliant? So when, when we use like a query here, for example, selling cat ID, description from mock item, yada, 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 if we can push the entire query down to a columnar index with TentV, we can push the count. The problem is the columnar index might not contain rows that we want to, to return. And we'll cover MVCC in a second. If we blindly do count over, over TentV, it's not going to give us necessarily the correct results because the Postgres visibility checker might not have, have played. This is a big problem. And in fact, we considered working with the TentV aggregates in the first place before rather than letting Postgres do them. And we would have incorrect results. And of course, fast aggregates are great, but they need to be accurate. So for those of you that are not familiar, MVCC is the multi-version concurrency control implementation in Postgres. It essentially says like when you update or delete a row, if you don't actually update or delete a, a, a physical data on disk in Postgres, you simply append a logical record that says what has happened to the row. And then the Postgres vacuuming process will um, will work on that to, to re, you know, resolve the state of the database. This is all based on those like snapshots that it creates. And when um, 
it guarantees essentially it's responsible for guaranteeing whether um you know specific transactions are allowed to see specific rows that's a core underlying of postgres and we need to be able to work with that when we bring a separate query engine like something data like data fusion in this case this is an example of transaction isolation that you know at a very very high level for all of you that you know that are students at cmu i'm sure this is essentially 101 but um you know if i'm thinking okay which row, you know, whether a transaction should see a row or not, then the question is like, what rows are a transaction allowed to see? Let's say I have connection A and B, and you know, transaction A inserts into a table but hasn't committed. Can I can B read the transaction? That would be a dirty read. If A inserts and commits, but B hasn't committed, can it read the transaction? That's called a phantom read. I'm gonna skip over over the rest, but these are sort of the four ways in which people do transaction isolation in Postgres. And you can see them in a the table here. The default one that Postgres comes with is read committed. So it's not possible to do a dirty read. It's not possible for a transaction to read a transaction that hasn't committed from a different process. In order for us to start bringing something like data fusion inside of Postgres to do those, um, to, to crunch the aggregates, to do the faceted search, we would need to at least, at the very least, match the integration of MVCC to have read committed support on the way we deal with aggregates. And in fact, it's possible in Postgres to also enable the other levels of isolation. And so ideally, our implementation would be fully MVCC compliant. This is not easy. Can I ask um, you a quick clarification question? Please, please. So uh, let's see, PrayDB is, is mostly like uh, an extension in Postgres, right? So I guess yeah. you're, you're then accepting inserts into the Postgres side um, are you then actually, so, so like your interaction with TNTV is actually to index what you have inserted in Postgres. I, I was kind of having the impression that there was some storage that TNTV has access to that you're loading into Postgres, but that's totally not the case, correct? Correct. Sorry, if I've covered this a bit briefly, all of this happened in the index access method layer. So you okay. use Postgres in any standard way. You can write the heap tables, insert, update, and so on. And then on the tables on which you define a BM25 index, we will index that via TenTV and store it in the index. So that's the storage that TenTV has access to. This is okay. the area yeah, that, that we would need. Yeah, this is the area that we would need to give MVCC compliance because in the case of um, in the case of of standard Postgres indexes, the visibility checker will act on the return, the results returned by the index. So you don't need to worry about this, basically. It uses the full standard Postgres way to do things. Even if there are dead rows within the index, the visibility checker will filter them out. But in the case of our index, if we're actually using data fusion, it's not going to have access to the visibility checker. So we would need to come up with a solution on, on how to do that and make sure that our index remains MVCC compliant, even if it's using data fusion. OK. Um, anyways, so I'll cover this also very briefly, but transaction isolation that relies on snapshots or states of the database at a specific color, at, at a specific point in time, excuse me. Each transaction ID contains the, you know, the transaction ID and the committed transaction ID. In Postgres, it's known as Xmin and Xmad, Xmax, excuse me. And then Postgres uses the snapshots to meet the visibility requirement. What we could do is do something similar, essentially, right? We could try to have data fusion call the visibility checker function to determine whether, you know, whatever row is visible against a snapshot. That's something that we could do. And that would be, that would give us the ability to give MVCC compliance while using data fusion as a query engine for processing the columnar storage fast fields of Tentui. The problem is data fusion is multi-threaded, Postgres isn't. As I mentioned before, the custom scan API is one of the very rare areas in Postgres where you actually can have parallel execution. So it would be possible for us to go and perhaps implement this. This is something we're currently investigating right now. That's solution one, maybe. Another solution is we could re-implement MVCC. This sounds pretty crazy, but it's actually been done before by other folks. So we could re-implement the Postgres visibility checker function within the TNTV index ourselves and then have Data Fusion be, be aware of that. So as I mentioned, the Xmin and Xmax, are, Xmin is when the transaction gets gets you know committed and Xmax is when the row gets updated or deleted. It's zero if it's, if it's never happened. We could use Postgres triggers to do that. 
The problem in that case is that it causes a lot of write amplification. The Postgres standard index doesn't store anything around xmin and xmax because when the Postgres query planner fetches the data and applies the visibility checker on it, it can actually filter the data out. So it doesn't matter whether the post a standard Postgres index stores that information. In our case, if we went with it, we wouldn't need to do that. And that can cause a decent amount of write amplification. It's also, you know, a can of worms, obviously. Um, Eric on our team is the author of a project called ZomboDB previously, which was a Postgres extension to interoperate an Elasticsearch cluster with Postgres. And he wanted to do that in an MVCC way. So he actually has built storing MVCC related information at XMIN and XMAX directly into his ZomboDB index. That's something that our team has some experience with around, but we would prefer to avoid that as much as possible. That's option number two. Or you know, maybe there are other options if any of you guys you know, can think of, we'd we'll be very curious to hear them. But in general, our North Star as we are working today is an MVCC safe, fast faceting engine in Postgres. In a lot of ways, this is essentially a columnar implementation in Postgres, but done properly. If we do that, we might eventually be able to go beyond faceted search, which as a reminder is full text uh, analytics over full text search results and actually accelerate any type of analytical query in Postgres. But that requires working in a lot of ways, node by node, to make sure that when the plan gets optimized, we can maintain full MVCC compliance along the way. And that's not easy work. It's been explored by a few people, as I mentioned. It's been explored by some folks at Postgres Pro in a project called VOPS that you can look up online. It's been explored by um, you know, Eric and the folks at ZombleDB when they were working on it. And there's a lot of attention that's being poured into the space right now for how to build a proper analytical engine in Postgres. But this is, this is where we're at, and this is how we're thinking about it. And that's it. If any of you guys are interested in, in hearing more about what we do, you can look us up on GitHub. You can, you know, we're pretty responsive. You can give the product a spin as well. And yeah, we're excited to do, to do what you do with it. And I'm happy to take any other questions. Awesome. I will clap on behalf of uh, the audience. Uh, we, have, we have several minutes for questions. So if you have any, unmute yourself and go for it. So there's there's PG you have PG search and that's mm -hmm. data fusion or that tend to be in data fusion is that correct? Correct. Or, and then the PG Lakehouse can you talk about what that was? Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm happy to. So this um, I wish I had added some of those slides from a different talk, but I removed them. Um, we when we started our our work, we started by doing ten to be in Postgres, and people started requesting analytic support, right? That fast facets that I was describing that got us interested into other ways in which we could potentially speed up analytics in Postgres. The first foray we did was with an extension called PG Analytics that you heard initially, where we actually integrated data fusion at the table layer. So just like you can modify the index layer, Postgres APIs expose the table layer storage. And we can create your own table. You can store data in your own way. And we had used Data Fusion and, um, and Delta RS to implement some sort of asset compliant columnar storage in Postgres. That is a whole can of worms that we ended up pausing the work on in order to focus on this. And um, we had repurposed our PG Analytics work into a new, a third extension we made called PG Lakehouse, where this time we use DuckDB. This is what is now called PG Analytics. And we essentially build a foreign data wrapper in Postgres, which is powered by DuckDB to read data from remote object storage like AWS S3, and then do fast analytics over it. Postgres has the concept of uh, foreign tables, which are tables that are referencing external data. And that's what we use our PG Lakehouse extension for with DuckDB. Got it, but like, so some, but someone downloads pretty DB the, the the primary use case is going to be the the full text search stuff you talked about today. Like that's that's your Correct. bread and butter. Got it. Correct. That's our that's our bread and butter. Our PG Lakehouse or PG Analytics extension is essentially an ingestion API. So the way people use it today is they read data from S3, create a Postgres table out of it, and then do a BM25 index on it to search it. Got it. Awesome. All right, we have time for more questions from everyone in the audience. So I have one question here. So could you have added the BM25 uh, ranking to the existing gen index, gen plus TS vector? Would that, what would have been the result? Or for not doing that, for not adding it to the gen index? Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that you could have done the BM25 ranking as part of gen existing. It could have ex extended 
TS Vector Engine Index with BM25 ranking. And that would have been a much smaller amount of work. But would that, ah. would that have worked? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. So there's, there's two things to that answer. One is in order to do that, we would have need to work with Postgres core instead of working as an extension. Um, so, you know, perhaps less overhead in, in that, in the number of lines of codes written, but working with Postgres core is much harder. It's also much slower. Um, the release cycle is, is slower intentionally to keep it, to keep it very, very sturdy. So that would have been more difficult. The other uh, thing is, as I was mentioning, Postgres doesn't store uh, term frequency statistics across the entire corpus. And VM25 requires that. So because the gen index works in a way that you can create it over a single column, for example, or you can create multiple gen indexes on the same table, um, it would have been difficult for the VM25 algorithm to be implemented without some other serious modification inside of Postgres core. I've actually talked about this with, with many folks who are core committers, but um, in our case, it was much easier to keep things in a fully scoped way and work directly off of 10 Okay. All right, so Steve Moy asks, uh, the interop between Postgres pages, row based, and arrow record batches, columnar row groups, how would the, the two square off? Don't you lose performance between the two wire formats? Yes, yes, thank you. I forgot to, to cover this. This is a very good question. So when we were working with Data Fusion previously at the table layer, we encountered this. Um, there are a bunch of, of Postgres types, for example, varchar and text, which we would represent, I believe, as UTF-8 in, in Arrow. And so we would need some way to be able to like map it back and forth, and you lose some degree of precision. What we would do is we would infer based on the schema of the table which we were working with, which field to map it back to. But in the case of user-defined functions, like overloaded UDS, for example, we weren't able to do that. And so that is something that we literally left as um, you know, as unimplemented as an edge case in that previous implementation. In our case here today, when we end up working with um, 10 TV and Data Fusion, we will need to face some of those challenges again and decide how to resolve them. The good thing with working with Arrow is compared to the to the uh, like in-house columnar implementation that 10 TV has, Arrow has a much wider range of fields uh, of type supported. Excuse me. So that would be a much smaller. Um, you know, much less data loss, basically, or precision loss between the conversion. But that is a difficult challenge. It's actually quite a big deal uh, when you're trying to work with the two of them. And I wish I give, I had like a perfect answer to give you. Maybe the best possible answer is having Arrow support all the Postgres types. That would be wonderful. But I don't know if that's something that's going to happen. Yeah, that wasn't happening either. Um, <laughs> I, so the, the last thing I'll say is it'd be interesting to see uh, going back to like, how do you determine the visibility of, of tuples? I suspect, I don't know if this is true. I suspect like the format of like the min max, X min max values that Postgres maintains. I bet that it hasn't changed since the eighties when they originally designed the transaction scheme. Maybe there's some yeah. new fields that they've added, but like it probably is one of the most like battle hardened and, uh, stable parts of Postgres. I mean, Postgres is pretty stable as it is, but like, yeah, you could implement it on the outside knowing that like, it's not going to get changed from underneath you you know, a year from now. So it might yeah. actually make, make sense to do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is why, you know, we call this the section of the talk ongoing work. Um, the truth is we don't know exactly which one is going to make sense for us to do. And we're currently investigating it. If we do another talk, you know, in a year, I can tell you what we found. Um, but that's the thing that's good with working with Postgres. The APIs don't change very much, even between major versions. So we can feel pretty confident building on top of them. <laughs>